win. <laughs> All right, I think we're ready to get started. Uh, today we're going to be talking about incident response on Mac OS. And uh, before we... Yeah, that's not working. There we go. All right, so um, before we get into it, just a little bit about myself. Uh, my name's Thomas Reed. I am director of Mac and Mobile at Malwarebytes. Um, I am very active on Twitter. That's my Twitter handle if you want to get hold of me for any reason. Um, also, just one quick note. Um, if you want to take pictures of any of the slides, that's fine. But I'll also, if you, you know, DM me on Twitter or something like that, or catch me afterwards, I'll give you my email address. Um, I'll be glad to send you a copy of the slides. So um, you don't have to take pictures if you don't want to. Um, all right, so let's get into it. So you got some Mac, maybe it's from a relative or a friend, or maybe it's some unmanaged machine in your environment, and you think it's infected. So what do you do next? That's what we're going to be talking about this whole time. And um, we're going to go over a lot of, of things that you can, like pieces of information that you can gather to help you figure out what happened. This is by no means comprehensive. Um, I could probably spend, I, I'm actually spending a whole day talking about this at a conference next month. Um, and I probably won't even cover everything then. So, you know, this is all, always a work in progress, always more to learn. So, um, there, there's a concept of forensic collection. This is not what we're going to be talking about today. Um, forensic collection generally requires that you do stuff like image the drive, get an entire memory dump. Uh, you know, that sort of thing. If you're looking for something, you know, forensically sound for evidential purposes or something along those lines, you know, something legal, um, I, I advise going with the professionals. You know, don't try and do this yourself because you want it to hold up in court. Um, so there are three companies here that I, I put up. Uh, they're well known in the Mac space. They have good Mac tools. Um, so if you're interested in f this kind of forensic um, legal data collection, give one of those companies a try. I have no affiliation with any of them. Um, I, I don't recommend any one over the other. They're just all very well-known, well-respected companies in the Mac space. Uh, all right, so um, for IR collection on the Mac, um, really this is not Mac specific, it's for any system. Um, but there are a number of different pieces of information that are very useful to gather uh, so that you can figure out what happened, what got dropped where, what did it do, um, you know, that, that sort of thing. Where did it come from? Uh, so uh, these are a number of different things that you can look at, things like persistence, what processes are running. Um, I'm not going to read the entire list here, um, but... There's a lot of information here that you can gather. And this is, again, just skimming the surface. There's a lot more that you can gather. You know, we aren't going to talk about doing things like, you know, PCAPs or, you know, that sort of thing. Um, but those are uh, that's stuff that can be done as part of your IR process. Um, so let's start out talking about persistence on macOS. Um, there are some that are really obvious and some that are not so obvious, especially if you don't know Mac OS that well. And some of these even might not be very obvious to somebody who's an expert at Mac OS. Um, so first of all, the number one most prevalent, most obvious are launch agents and daemons. Um, these are run by property list or plist files that are placed in one of three uh, locations, at least three locations that are accessible to um, to the user. Um, and those plist files specify some command or, or um, process that gets executed uh, on a periodic basis. Either, you know, maybe it'll keep it alive so that if the process crashes, it'll come right back up, or maybe it'll just 
launch it at every reboot, every login, something like that. You can see here on the right, there's an example of a malicious process. That's kind of suspicious there. You've got, you know, a direct call to SH right there in the, the, the plist file. Um, and some, um, you know, it's, it's using curl to pull something down to the machine and execute it. That's, you don't want to see that in a plist file. If you do, that's highly, highly suspicious. Um, that's probably malware. Um, if, if it's not malware, you, you probably ought to contact that company and tell them they're doing things wrong. <laughs> um, but gather all of the launch agents and launch daemons. That's going to be really important. The majority of malware out there today uses um, these launch agent and daemon plists. Login items are another pretty obvious item. They're also very popular with some kinds of threats, mostly pups and some adware, although it has been used by some malware too in the past. Um, these are fairly obvious. You set them in system preferences. They're right there. The user knows where to go look at them and can manage them very easily. So these are less common, less uh, popular than launch agents and daemons, but they're, it's really easy. You can set a login item just with a simple Apple script. So, you know, since this isn't hard to do, it's, it's another popular thing that some malware will do. Now, there's this new thing that a lot of people are not really that familiar with. These have been around for a couple of years now. They're, I call them hidden login items. Uh, this was created for uh, App Store apps. Uh, so an App Store app cannot create a launch agent or a daemon. It has no power to create a login item. So Apple provided this mechanism as a way for an app from the App Store to create a persistent helper of some kind. Um, so what you do, you can see here on the right side, that's a, a snapshot of an application bundle. And inside the bundle, you create this login item uh, that has a, a helper application in it. And then you, um, you register that app with the, uh, the uh, service management framework, and boom, you've got a login item. Um, so all this requires is that the user you know, has the app on the system, and that login item can become active. There is no central registry that you can find that, that lists all of these. You can't see them in the user interface. They don't show up in the login items and system preferences. Um, there's no single property list file or anything like that that lists all of these. Um, so these are starting to become more popular uh, for malware, uh, especially adware and pups. And... Um, they're a pain in the ass because you basically have to iterate over every application on your system and check it to see if it contains one of these login items. Uh, it's, it's really a pain in the butt. Um, I, I hope that Apple gives us a way to enumerate these better in the future, but right now it's, it's, they're very, very hidden. So easy to hide. Cron is another uh, somewhat popular thing that's been used by some adware in the past. Um, not a whole lot, but vSearch, uh, also known as Pirate, uh, is one that has used this a lot on macOS. Um, Cron was actually deprecated a long time ago on macOS, but this still works today all the way up to the current version of macOS Mojave. Um, and you can see here this is an example of a, um, a cron task that was created by vSearch. Um, that's not suspicious at all. A process named stateliness.hu. Uh, I mean, there's nothing suspicious about that, right? So, um, but most people won't know that cron is there. They won't know how to look at this. So it, it doesn't matter that it's not sneaky. It, it's in cron where it's kind of kind of sort of hidden unless you're an expert user. Um, kernel extensions in the past have been kind of a problem, um, but that's waning now due to some changes that Apple has been making over the years to kernel extensions. Um, you know, for uh, uh, several years now, you've had to sign your kernel extensions using a certificate 
that has a special entitlement that you have to apply to Apple for. You have to justify why you want it. Um, at Malwarebytes, it took us several months to get that entitlement on our certificate so that we could sign a kernel extension. So this is not something that's easily obtained these days. And Apple has now announced that kernel extensions are being sunsetted soon. So um, uh, this next upcoming version of Mac OS will be the last one that runs kernel extensions without compromises, whatever that means. Um, not sure yet what that means, but I don't want to find out with our, our product at least. So these are some examples of kernel extensions that have been used in the past. Um, by the top two were both actual malware. This was back in the year 2000. So that tells you how long ago this was a problem. Uh, the bottom three there were all keyloggers or, um, you know, what's now call being called stalkerware. Um, but we really aren't seeing this a lot anymore. So it's, it's not going to be a long term problem. Still, if you see third-party kernel extensions on an infected machine, it can't hurt to gather the information about them, just in case. You never know when somebody might break the mold. Login hooks are very poorly known these days on macOS. They have been deprecated for a very long time, just like cron. Just like cron, they still work today all the way up to macOS Mojave. Uh, basically, a login hook is a particular property that can be added to the com.apple.login window preference file. And there is a preference uh, for every user and for the root user. Um, so you can add this to any specific user or you can add it to the root user's preference for all users on the whole system. Um, and basically what this does is it identifies some process that gets run at login you know so every time you log into the system it runs whatever this process is you can see here on the right uh, just some output um, from the the shell where I did a little proof of concept on Mac OS Mojave I dropped a um, a simple script called evil.sh on the desktop only had, you know, one command in it to touch a particular file named mwahaha. And then um, added that to the, the uh, you know, added a login hook for that. And you can see on a, on a log out and log back in that that file was created at the location indicated. So fully, fully functional on Mojave, even though it was deprecated a long time ago. And nobody knows about that these days except a few people like me. Um, startup items, uh, these also have been deprecated for a long time. Uh, but unlike the other things that have been deprecated, these actually don't work anymore. So they only work up to 10.9. If you try to collect data about the startup items on a more modern system, you're probably going to come up empty. Um, you might at best find some old startup items for old software that has been migrated through multiple system updates. Um, so on a mod, like if you're if you're doing a, any system from 10.10 .10 up, it's a waste of time to even look there. But if you have to look at an older system that's running 10.9 or earlier, it's it's not going to hurt to look in startup items. Um, and there are two locations you want to look at here. So. Um, there are a few other persistence techniques. Um, you know, I don't have time to go into all of them. So, you know, but if you have questions about it, feel free to, you know, talk to me later, ping me on Twitter or whatever. So let's skip on and talk about some um, process information. So one thing that's really useful uh, for for your analysis later is to just grab a list of all processes and the ps command is really useful for that by default it doesn't really give you all the information that you might want so i recommend running it like this to get these additional specific columns in the output um, that'll give you your your process id and the parent process id um, and it'll also give you 
the start time, um, the user that ran the command, what the specific command was. So that's really useful information to have. Um, you can also get a breakdown of all the files and network connections that are open by uh, per process uh, using the LSOF command. Or if you're really only interested in looking at the network stuff, uh, you can do LSOF-I. Uh, that's good information to have as well. Um, so just grab that information from the system and, and output it to a file. Um, and then that'll help you figure out, you know, what the process was doing. What files was it touching? Did it have network connections open and to where? Um, so that's good information to have. You can also look at install history. That can be very helpful for figuring out, um, you know, uh, what files might have been installed when. Uh, it's important to note, though, um, that this is only for Mac OS installer packages. So if you've got some custom application that's dropping stuff on the system, that doesn't register as an installation. Uh, it's only a .pkg file that's run through Apple's installer app. Uh, but if you have those, and there have been a number of .pkgs dropping you know, all kinds of malicious stuff, everything from malware to adware to pups. Um, and when you run an install like that, it will drop information into a couple places. Um, so on an older system, there's a, a library receipts folder. Uh, and there will be, for every installation, there will be a plist file and a, a bomb file or a bill of materials file. Um, and those will be stored for every single installation with complete details about what was installed, where, and when. Um, very useful information to have. Uh, there's also an installhistory.plist file that summarizes a lot of that stuff. So um, that's that's all very infor very good information. You want to grab that stuff. The .bomb files are going to be fairly large, so depending on um, how big your tolerance is for collecting a large amount of data from the infected system. You may or may not want those. Um, you can skip those and just collect the plist files. Um, there is more complete information in the bomb files if you're willing to grab that extra data. Now, in more modern systems, Apple has deprecated that location. They no longer put this information in that folder. Instead, they put it in private var db receipts. Uh, the one exception to the rule, though, is that install history.plist file that's in the old folder. That one still gets updated even on modern systems. I don't know why. I don't know why they didn't move it into the, the folder as well, uh, but that's where it is. So it doesn't matter. You want to collect that one file on any system, no matter how old it is or new. Um, and it's important to note that the install history.plist file has the more complete information. If you collect all the individual plist files from these folders, there's actually less information in them than there is in the install history.plist. So, but still grab all of it for redundancy. Uh, oh, I lost my connection here. There we go. All right. Browser history. Now, this is an obvious win, right? If you can grab the browser history, you can see potentially where the malware came from. Um, you can, you can uh, identify you know, the source and potentially get a copy of an installer. So maybe you haven't seen the whole malware, but if you can get hold of the installer and detonate it in a VM or on a test machine, then you really know a lot more. Um, so browser history is really important. Um, we actually had some malware recently where we just saw some components and we asked the customer to send us their browser history um, if they were willing, and they were, and we discovered where it came from, found the installer, um, you know, found a whole bunch more information about it. So if you can find that installer, it really, really does help you a lot. Ah, lost my connection again. There we go. So for Safari, 
The whole browser history is contained in a file called history.db at this path here. Um, if you can't see it in the back, don't just request the slides. <laughs> um, but this is all, it's got some very good data in there. Uh, there are there is a catch though it is protected by TCC which stands for transparency consent and control on Mac OS Mojave this is a new feature in Mojave that protects the user's privacy by requiring consent before an application can access certain locations and the Safari folder is one of those locations so if you're trying to con collect this data remotely you are not going to be able to grab that unless there's somebody sitting there to push a button and say, yes, you have permission to do so. Um, there was a vulnerability in Mojave that let you bypass TCC if you were using SSH to remote into the machine, um, which was really convenient if you were collecting data legitimately, but it's a vulnerability, so they fixed it. So unfortunately, you can't do that anymore. Um, this database is not locked when Safari is open, so if you want to grab specific data out of it, you don't have to worry about some, whether Safari is open or not. Um, it's a good idea to just grab the whole file, but you know if you if you did want to grab specific data, the really interesting data here is in the history visits and history items tables, where you can link the time to the URL, you know the the, the date and the time. Now that time is a, a kind of a weird number, and it is the number of seconds since January 1st, 2001. Apple likes that number for some reason. Chrome has a very, very similar history file. Uh, it's just called history, um, and it has a very similar structure in some ways. So you can see there's this, uh, visits and history items table with almost the same columns, um, you know, and, and again, you're linking the time and date to the URL. Um, this database is locked while Chrome's open, so you won't be able to pull data out of it without copying it or, um, you know, quitting Chrome. Um, but grab the file. You could also exfiltrate some of the data out of it as well if you wanted to. Um, and that time there is microseconds since January 1st, 1601. No idea why 1601. I'm sure somebody out there might know, but it's not me. Firefox, again, almost the same table structure here. Um, their file is called places.sqlite. Um, and uh, again, same, same columns there. And their visit date is second is microsecond since January first, nineteen seventy. Now, finally, there is another place you can actually get some information. That's from the quarantine database. So on macOS, every time an application that is what we call quarantine aware downloads a file. Um, it's going to use APIs that set a quarantine flag on that file, but it, an additional aspect of this is that the information about that file, about that download, is going to go into this quarantine database. Um, that's really useful. Um, you know, if you're if you're really only interested in, you know, what kind of .dmg or .pkg or .zip files did the user download, that's the database that's going to have the information in it. Um, it might also be in the history, but the history can be cleared by the user. It's not as easy to clear this quarantine history. So this will probably have intact data in it. Um, the, the, the database itself is there. It's again a, a, a SQLite 3 database. Um, and it, it's just a single table in the database. And the two most interesting columns there are the timestamp and the URL. Uh, and here again, the timestamp, just like with the Safari database, is the number of seconds since January 1st, 2001. There is one gotcha with this file, and that is for whatever reason, when you download a file in Safari, that data doesn't get stored in this database right away. 
I don't know exactly when it gets written. I did a test one time, and it was I, I downloaded something, and it still hadn't been written into that database a week later. Um, and then, of course, I forgot my test, and later I, I remembered and found the file in there. I had restarted the machine at some point. I don't know when. Um, haven't really gone back and done more testing, but I suspect it's written at reboot or when you quit Safari, something like that. Um, but so if you're collecting data from this file, Chrome and Firefox, they write their data in there right away. For whatever reason, with Safari, you may be missing some information. So um, try quitting Safari first just to make sure it's flushed is my advice. Bash information is also very useful to grab. Um, you know, it, there, there's uh, some configuration stuff here that can actually be abused for persistence potentially. So you've got all these files here on the on the the, the left side um, that get run every time the user starts up a, an interactive shell. So when the user opens up the terminal app. Every one of those scripts will get run automatically. Now, if you're a malware author, you might be thinking, oh, yeah, okay, some of those are in user land. I don't have to have any special permissions to write to that. So just add a line. You know, add some something in there that will give you persistence. I've never seen malware do that, and I've always wondered why. I mean, that seems like a no-brainer to me. Um, there's also uh, the, the bash RC file there that gets run when you start a non-interactive shell, like a, you know when a shell script launches. Um, and then there's the bash logout that runs at logout. Uh, those also could be used for persistence. You know you don't necessarily have to have the thing running while the shell's open. You could launch it after the, after they log out. So um, these are all good files to grab just in case maybe something abused it, added something to, to one of these files for persistence or for some other reason. Um, your bash history is a little bit difficult to grab. Um, so there's the history command in the terminal. Um, that's good information to grab if you can grab it. The problem is you can't grab that from a shell script. If you grab it from a shell script, it's going to return nothing. Um, so you have to be in an active terminal on the device. Um, it'll only have, you know, if, if the user's got the terminal open, then it, there's an in-memory buffer that holds this information that the history command uh, returns. So you'll be able to get that information. But if the users quit the terminal, um, then that in-memory buffer gets flushed and this will have nothing in it. Um, so might be useful, might not be useful. Uh, the dot .bash history file, um, this actually is where the historic information gets written. So when you are in the terminal, you've, you've run a bunch of commands in the terminal, and then you quit or you log out of the session, whatever, um, then that in-memory buffer gets flushed to disk to this file. And it, it basically gets appended and... Um, uh, the file gets truncated after a certain size. Uh, so this is a good file to grab. This can give you a lot of that good information, that good historical information that you want. You can grab it from a shell script. The, the gotcha with this one, though, is that if the user's got an active terminal, you're not going to get any of the history from that terminal in that file because it hasn't been flushed there yet. Um, and so, you know, you've got to kind of take these with a grain of salt. Also, you've got to keep in mind that if the user runs some kind of a shell script, or maybe not the user, but some malicious process runs a shell script, that doesn't show up in either of these. Um, so you're going to miss out on that information. There's a lot that can be done by malware with the system's configuration. There's a variety of configuration things that can be done. Um, so this is all really important information to grab. SPCTL status, that basically tells you if um, Gatekeeper is turned on or not. If it's not turned on, 
that's a big red flag because that means that everything on the system that's being launched, there's no checking. You know, Mac OS has some basic uh, anti-malware built into it. But if you turn off Gatekeeper, you've basically turned off all of it. So you're, you've got no protection. So if you, if you see that, that's a red flag. You want that on. Um, CSR util status. Uh, that also is a big red flag if that's off. That gives you information about whether system integrity protection is enabled. Um, uh, system integrity protection, or SIP, is a new feature in uh, uh, macOS El Capitan, if I'm remembering correctly, um, that it protects all the system folders against uh, against modification, even by the root user. Um, so the root user cannot modify the system in El Capitan or later. Um, and that's a really great security feature. So if that's turned off, that's another serious uh, red flag. Um, FDE setup status. Um, that identifies whether file vaults on. This is not really for mal for for identifying malware, but if you see that it's off, that's a sign that maybe somebody could have had physical access to this machine and then done whatever they wanted to it. You know, I mean, you could get your physical access um, and add some files to the system. So that that would be a potential sign. If you think somebody had physical access and did something malicious, that that's that's a sure sign that it was possible. Um, you also probably want to grab the user list. There are a variety of ways to do it, um, but it's a it's a very good idea to grab that. Some malware has been known to create hidden users on the system uh, and then run a proxy through that user. So the proxy process is running under that user. Uh, and that sort of hides all that activity. Um, but if you look for that, that hidden user, then you can identify something fishy is going on. Um, another item to look for is this KC password file. That's basically uh, an XORD um, copy of the user's login password if they have auto login turned, in, turned on. Uh, if you see that, that's another one of the red flags that might indicate somebody could have had physical access to this machine and made changes. Um, so if you see that, it's a, it's a definite security concern. Um, and then you probably also want to dump all the trusted certificates on the system uh, with the security command. We have seen a lot of mostly adware lately that is using... Um, configuration profiles on the system to force the user's browser to a particular home page. And with this configuration profile installed, the user cannot change their home page. So they'll go into Safari or they'll go into Chrome. The home page is on some funky page like we know.ac or something like that. And they go into the preferences and it's grayed out. They can't even select the field. Um, and most users don't know about these system configuration profiles, so they have no idea how to fix it. So grab the, um, you know, grab those and see what's there. Um, and I just realized I was talking about something else. <laughs> um, I'm talk. I was just talking about the. Um, it's going to be up here somewhere. The the. Security command actually dumps all the certi trusted certificates, which we've also seen adware dumping on the system to man in the middle code, man in the middle your your network connection. Um, sorry, can, I got a little ahead of myself there. Um, so you can also check things like the application firewall. Um, that one's a little bit less useful because if you turn on some something in the sharing settings, it just goes ahead and punches a hole right through the firewall for you. So, you know, if, if you've got a sharing item turned on, the firewall is useless anyway. Um, the PF firewall, um, oops, how did I skip ahead? The PF firewall, um, that's a, a more advanced firewall on macOS, uh, accessible only through the command line. Um, it's much more powerful, much more useful, uh, but most users won't have it turned on. 
Um, when you you definitely want to grab the rules for that though, because we have seen some malware using PF rules to run proxies. Um, so they they put some information, they put some rules in there that you know. Uh, force all of your HTTP traffic through a particular process. Um, so that's that's something you want to look out for. Um, the proxy settings here, um, that's another thing to check. I, I've mentioned proxies multiple times here. Um, you know, this is a very popular thing for some malware and adware to do is to just proxy, proxy stuff through their, their process or through their server. So you want to check that. Uh, DNS settings haven't been abused a lot lately, but they have been abused in the past. Um, you can uh, change the settings to a malicious DNS server to uh, redirect the user to phishing pages or, you know, something along those lines. Um, so, so grab the DNS settings when you're looking at a, a, an infected machine. And then, of course, the hosts and the, um, the sudoers file. Uh, both of those files are really important. They have been known to be modified by malware and adware in the past. Um, so, so definitely grab those. Um, in particular, in the hosts file, um, we've seen malware that will block apple.com. So this prevents download, for example, of security updates. Um, so, you know, you can prevent your malware from being detected. Uh, removed after Apple's found out about your malware and added signatures to it to their built-in AV. Um, you, we've also seen malware blocking VirusTotal so that you can't submit their samples, their files to VirusTotal. Um, and then we've also seen um, a lot of blocks for things like Adobe.com. And those are generally private, uh, or piracy oriented. That's a big red flag. Um, we just found this new malware, this new crypto miner last week, this past week, uh, and it was being installed through a variety of piracy um, installers. So that's a big source of malware on Mac OS. If you see that somebody's been engaging in piracy, you'll see signs of it probably in the hosts file. That's an indicator of where that malware might have come from. Um, and then finally here, the profiles we, I, I mentioned earlier about the profiles and forcing the user's browser to a particular page. Um, you can see here, there's an example of such a profile. Um, uh, and it, you can see here this long URL, www.weno.ac. Um, so Definitely grab the profiles from the system and, and see if there's anything that you didn't put there if you're the admin. Um, all right. Logs, obviously, you know, everybody wants to know how to collect logs for IR purposes. And it's, it's actually not 100% straightforward on Mac. Um, so historically, there used to be a couple different kinds of logs. There were just the general system logs. Um, these, this was, uh, you know, like system.log, just a plain text log file. Um, and like Unix log files, it gets rotated periodically. You know, the old stuff gets gzipped um, and archived, and the new log starts up. There were also Apple system logs or ASL logs, and those are binary logs stored in a different location. Um, in order to read those, you had to use the syslog command or the console app. Um, you know, you couldn't really look at those in a text editor like with the, uh, the system log file. Um, both of these are very easy to collect and easy to view. You know, the binary logs are a little more of a pain to view, um, but still very easy to view as long as you're on a Mac. Um, but these are useless on uh, Mac OS Sierra and later because Apple quit using them. So in a lot of cases, like if you try and look at these ASL logs, it's just going to tell you, you know, don't look here, you know, look somewhere else. And that somewhere else on Sierra and later is the unified logs. Um, now this is a new logging system. 
Uh, it relies a lot on, you know, a lot of the logging is in memory, and then it's also uh, stored on disk. Um, it's very, very verbose. There is a huge amount of information in there. Um, for that reason, that if you dump these logs, you could easily end up with a gig of data. Um, you know, it's it's almost ridiculous how much data there is in these logs. Um, so uh, they're definitely worth having, um, but it's you're going to be chewing up a lot of data to to grab that. Um, in addition, they kind of made the console app more or less useless in Sierra and above. Previously, you could open up the console app, you could see all that historic data and all the log files, you could scroll back in the history, um, see everything that had happened. You know, it was a nice one-stop shop for looking at the logs. In Sierra and later, you open up the console and your history starts now. It, uh, you see nothing that happened before you open the console. And all you see when you open it is just a constantly scrolling and sometimes scrolling really fast list of lines of, of logs. Um, so it's really not useful to use the console app anymore. Um, these days, you access the logs, these unified logs, through the logs command in the terminal. Um, now, if you want to collect these logs for later use, there's not a particular file that you can grab. These files are kind of scattered over a, you know, multiple folders, and some of the data is not even stored in a file yet. It's going to be cached in memory still. Um, so you can't just grab a file. You've got to use the logs command to uh, collect it. So you can, for example, do sudo log collect and direct the output to a folder. Uh, it'll create uh, a bundle which on macOS, if you're not familiar, a bundle is basically a folder that looks like a file. Uh, and so this bundle will contain all the log information. Now, when you do it this way, that's where you get like a, a gig or maybe more of data. Um, it was a gig on my system. So, uh, so that's a lot of data. You know, if you're doing this remotely over the internet, you probably don't want to transfer one one gigabyte of data over the network. Um, you know, especially if you're connecting remotely from offsite or something like that. Um, so, what you can do is you can uh, there the logs command is very very um, dynamic. You can do a lot of things with it. Uh, just an example of a couple things you could do is to limit by time. So, for example, you could say start from, you know, whatever date. You just give it a date that you want it to start collection from, and it'll output every piece of information from that date forward. Um, or you can say last seven days or last three days or, you know, whatever period of time you're interested in. Um, and that'll give you a smaller dump. Um, but it kind of assumes that you kind of, if you kind of know the time frame of when the machine got infected, that's okay. It's also, now this, this is time consuming and it, it can be a lot of data, um, but a detailed file listing for the entire system is very useful to have. Um, you know, especially if maybe you won't have access to the, this machine later. And you want to get some information about a file that was not contained in any of the other information you grabbed. So one thing you can do here is use the ls command with all these different flags that I've added here. The, the capital R makes it recursive. And so you could point this at your root directory and it will give you output for every file on your system, which would be useful. Um, the the problems with this, though, um, is that it only shows the modified, last modified timestamp, which is sometimes useful, but not always. Um, it's also very messy to read, um, you know, and, and you can't really take this and dump it into Splunk or something like that. It's, it's really hard to process. Um, but it it does have some good information here, um, like uh, extended attributes and ACLs. You can get all that information here. Um, 
Another alternative is to use Python and use OS Walk and OS Stat. Um, and those you can use to give you structured output. So if you wanted to output this to some kind of a log, pro, you know, aggregator like Splunk, um, that's really good. You can get all the all three of the timestamps created, modified, and accessed, um, not just the modified time. You can format the time however you want. So if you want to put it in UTC, you can. Um, and you can also skip items to make this a little more efficient. So, for example, we mentioned SIP earlier. If you can look at the flags and see that a particular directory is protected by SIP, don't even bother recursing down into that directory because everything in there should be um, off limits. Um, so you can that that helps you with your your efficiency and the the size of the data you grab. Um, the problem there is that you, you, you're missing the extended attributes, you're missing the ACLs. There's, there's not really a good way to grab that. So maybe, you know, if you're interested in that, um, you could code up a script, for example, that anytime it encounters a .dmg file or a .zip file, um, that it grabs the where from, uh, metadata from the extended attributes, or maybe, you know, uh, you know, do something like if you come across uh th this is not really listed on here but if you come across an an actual process go ahead and grab the code signing information from it you know so there's a lot you can do with that in python which is why i kind of like that so uh we're nearing the end here um i've thrown a lot of information at you i'm sure that you have not remembered all of it by any means um and there's a lot that I haven't thrown at you. Uh, so I have this tool that I, I created. Um, I actually have just put it up on GitHub in the last couple of days here. Um, it's the Post-Infection Collection Toolkit. You know, really imaginative name. Um, and it's basically a set of Python scripts. It's the, They're designed to be very extensible and modular, so you can write your own modules and add them to it. Uh, if you, there's particular information it, that you want to collect that it's not collecting. Um, and the GitHub um, address is right there if you want to grab it and look at it. Um, this is just one of many good scripts out there. Um, so I don't want to monopolize with my own script. Um, there's a another similar set of scripts called OSX Collector from Yelp. Uh, they made this public. Um, and then uh, you can also, if you're really interested in this topic, I highly recommend Jaron Bradley's book on the topic. Uh, it's OSX Incident Response Scripting and Analysis, and it's available on Amazon. It's a little dated by now. Some of the information is is a little old, but the principles are really good, and a lot of the information is still relevant. Um, and then if you're interested in doing something more proactive, you know, monitoring uh, and grabbing data uh, in your environment, um, Richie Cyrus has released some tools. Uh, he's released a, a, a bunch of Python scripts called Venator, uh, and that can be used to gather a lot of the same data in a format that can be put up into Splunk. So it, it'll gather the data in JSON form. Um, and then OS Query, if you're not familiar with it, it's a, um, it's a really neat monitoring tool. It kind of sits on your, your endpoint. You can configure what exactly it does, what kinds of information it logs. Basically treats your system like an SQL database, and you can do queries on it and stuff like that, and run queries on a periodic basis. Um, it's very, very cool. I mean, you, you'd have to kind of code your code up what information you wanted yourself, write your queries. Um, but it's extremely powerful and versatile and, and in very, very popular in the Mac community. And that is it. Um, I'm open to any questions. And if you, again, if you want a copy of the slides, uh, please just let me know. So, questions? All right. Oh, yep.
Am I taking pull? Absolutely. If you if you want to submit some changes, I'll be glad to take a look. I'll be glad to you know accept those changes. So, yeah. Yeah, the question was, do do we ever see malware that is uh, checking to see if the system's virtualized? And absolutely, we do. We've seen a lot of different ways that's done. So we've seen everything from, you know, looking for the specific MAC addresses that the various VM vendors use for their VMs, which is really easy to to avoid. You know, you just put a custom MAC address in and you bypass that check, all the way up to very sophisticated um, checks of the hardware. So, you know, get information about the number of processors, the amount of disk space, the, you know, the amount of RAM, all this information, you put it all together and um, determine whether it looks like a VM or not. And so, you know, some of this malware does this kind of stuff that makes it very difficult to actually analyze it in a VM. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, for that reason, a lot of my testing these days is actually done on a real machine, not a, not in a VM. Anybody else? All right. Well, thank you very much for your time.